Good afternoon, everyone. I am Marcia Tashman, the Visual Resources and Public Services Librarian at Cornell University. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this Chats in the Stacks with Barry Perlis, where he will discuss his beautiful book, Celestial Mirror, The Astronomical Observatories of Jai Singh II, which was published in July of 2020. The book images and describes the experiences of visiting observatories in northern India, as well as providing historical context and analysis of their scientific and architectural innovations. To begin, I want to acknowledge that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gai Kohono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gai Kohono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. At Cornell, we recognize the painful history of the Gai Kohono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gai Kohono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to let you know that a question and answer session will follow this presentation. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get as many to as many as we can after the talk. There's a discount code on this slide to purchase Celestial Mirror from Yale University Press. And if you would like to buy a personalized signed copy of the book, you can visit the website www. .jantarmantar.org. Barry Perlis is an Associate Professor Emeritus and former Associate Dean in the College of Art, Architecture and Planning at Cornell University, where he taught photography courses at the graduate and undergraduate level since 1984. He received an MFA from Ohio University and a BA from Case Western Reserve University. With an avid interest in both art and science, his artistic practice includes projects in photography and digital media, and notably panoramic and immersive imagery. As an artist, scholar, author, and educator, Professor Perlis has received numerous grants from organizations, including the Anaudi Center for International Studies at Cornell and the Graham Foundation for Advanced Study in the Fine Arts. Portfolios of his photographs have appeared in national publications such as Parabola Magazine and Progressive Architecture, and his work has been shown in more than 50 one-person and group exhibitions, both in the U.S. and abroad. He recently authored a seven-course certificate program in digital photography for eCornell. Please welcome Barry Perlis. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And um, I'm just very happy to be here. Uh, and I'd like to thank also the Cornell University Libraries for hosting the talk today. Celestial Mirror is really, um, in one sense, it's the culmination of uh, 30 years of um, work and interest in the astronomy observatories built by Jai Singh in India. Um, and I'll be kind of walking you through the book in a moment. Um, and right now, I'm just going to need to do a screen share. Um, give me a moment here, sorry. All right. Um, so, as I was saying, Celestial Mirror, um, the book, is culmination of a project um, about Jai Singh's observatories. And I think to get started, before I even go into detail in the book, I just want to give you a few facts about the content um, and you know let's see so the observatories were built in the early 1700s um, and they're 
based on a kind of astronomy that did not use telescopes, um, merely its ancient astronomy of direct naked eye sky observation. Uh, the telescope had existed for some time when Jai Singh built the observatories, but uh, he was not so much interested in penetrating the great distance um, in the cosmos as getting really accurate data about the positions and the motions of celestial bodies. Um, it's uh, one of the most amazing things about these observatories is that they are built on very large scale. So um, we know of ancient forms of astronomical measurement, Stonehenge, for example, um, the pyramids in Egypt. And these observatories in Jai Singh are on a scale like this. Um, but what is remarkable about them really is that the forms of the buildings that he designed, while they're based on earlier models, um, when they were taken up to the scale that he took them, um, and also when they incorporated the mathematics that was necessary to reflect uh, the different ways in which astronomers um, study the cosmos and describe the position of things in space, um, they become architecturally very unique. The forms involve triangles, quadrants, arcs, cylinders, um, spheres, hemispheres. And the result of these combinations um, is an architecture that's unlike any we're really familiar with, and certainly unlike anything that existed in India at the time. Uh, in fact, um, the Jantar Mantars, as the observatories are called, um, have been of interest to architecture students and architects um, for a long time. So finally, um, there is a really powerful effect of being inside a space that reflects the cosmic order. And we'll get into that um, as we start to look at the images in the book. But I just wanted to give you a little more background. This is a map of India and it gives the location of the five observatories that Jai Singh built. Only four exist currently. The one in Mathura um, was destroyed in the 1800s. Of the four remaining ones, the two largest ones are in the north, in Delhi and in Jaipur. Um, and those are the ones that we'll actually take a look at. So I thought rather than um, try to explain in words anymore, we might just have a better idea of the observatories by flying over there. And from a helicopter view, the observatory in Delhi, you can see the fabric of the city. Um, and you probably notice now that this sort of park complex has buildings that are very unusual in design. Um, mechanical looking, uh, certainly geometric. So we'll just get our feet on the ground here, or at least at the top of one of the biggest instruments, um, the great sundial in New Delhi. And take a, a look around, you, you can see that um, problematically uh, in the large buildings near the observatory encroach on its airspace. So it isn't possible to do all of the measurements anymore. Um, and these uh, images are from 2004, so uh, the city is probably much more built up since then. But you get a sense of the size, the scale, and uh, both the beauty and precision, even though the condition of the instruments is uh, really not well maintained, um, you can still see what they are. This is inside the Ramayantra cylindrical instrument. This central column uh, is a sighting guide. And uh, just about every surface in this instrument carried inscriptions and index marks 
So the astronomers used the whole of the interior space. They stood in between these horizontal slabs of stone, which all have um, degree markings on them. And uh, they were about chest height. And that was where they did their observations. So we'll just kind of, for the sake of continuing our virtual tour, do a helicopter jump to Jaipur, um, another very modern city, um, where at the very center you have the original city of Jaipur that Jai Singh designed. Um, and within this small walled city, um, the observatory complex is just outside his um, palace complex. And again, you can recognize that triangular shape of the sundial and the cylindrical forms of the Ramayantra. So on the ground here in Jaipur, we're on top of one of the small uh, instruments. There are 12 of them that each measure the crossing of the meridian of one of the constellations of the zodiac. And we'll um, kind of pan across and see some of the other instruments at the complex as we look here into the middle. Those two white discs are the rims of the bowl instrument, the Jai Prakash. Uh, Nadi Valaya Yantra, that circular red object behind them. And we end up looking at the great sundial. Now that triangular wall is about 70 feet in height. And uh, the size of the instrument is one of the things that makes it so precise. Looking down on the zodiac instruments and the Jai Prakash. And now we're at the quadrant index of the Great Sunda. And you see the shadow cast there um, on that quadrant. This is inscribed in time increments down to two seconds. And it is possible to get that kind of precision. There's a, a passageway through the wall to the other side where the, uh, the other quarter arc circle or quadrant um, on the east is used to measure the hours after noon. We're at the top of that quadrant. You can see the very steep steps. And there's a really unique design in the steps. Um, that enables the observers to stay close to the index as they go up. Now we've jumped to the other side of the complex and we're looking back um, across at the great sundial. And in front of us is a small hemispherical bowl. And this was both a kind of a, a chart, uh, it contains two um, index systems that astronomers use, the um, equatorial system and the um, horizontal system or horizon-based system for positioning or determining the position of an object. That small bowl was also the model for this larger instrument, which is the um, Jai Prakash. And you'll notice that these instruments come in pairs uh, and I'll try to speak about that as we look. Um, the astronomers would be down inside measuring, using a sighting guide to measure up um, through a crosswire, which has a sighting guide in it above. We'll see that in a moment. On the um, brightly lit part of the index, you see a small circular shadow. That's a shadow of the sighting guide. And in the daytime, it gives both the time and day of, of the sun by virtue of the sun's shadow. At night, the astronomers would use a sighting guide and look up through the hole in this crosswire at a specific sky object and mark its position on the scale below. Now, I'll just say that in the process of doing observations, um, to be inside the instrument meant that. Half of the instrument wasn't available because we were actually standing in a void um, where there was no surface to mark on. So these two hemispheres are exact complements uh, where one has an index, the other has a void. 
and the astronomers would walk back and forth between those two instruments um, hour by hour to be able to make continuous measurements. And I'll touch on that again, but now um, let's just open the book and I'll walk you through it. Uh, I want to kind of keep things moving so we have time for questions. Um, the book is um, my design and it has a long kind of story, really, um, the story of many incidences and, and different people. Um, it was prompted really by uh, a gentleman who wrote to me from India, who's a bookseller um, near the observatories. And he said that there were no really good explanatory books about the observatory. And at that point, I had created a, a very comprehensive website www.jantarnantar.org, which had all of the panoramic photography and uh, explanations about how the observatories work. And he said, well, you should do a book. And we wrote back and forth, and I uh, shared some ideas. And it turned out that the time frame that he was thinking of was just much faster than it was going to be possible for me to do. Um, but the idea stayed with me, and I kept working on it, and I eventually had a design and then kind of proposed the book to different publishers and ultimately wound up um, talking with an editor at Yale, at which point the design process really got serious. <clears throat> and um, so this is what we have. Uh, and I just want to briefly talk about the contents because it's a way of talking about the design. Um, there's a brief introduction from me, both about the book and the process and the larger project. Um, there's a very important essay written by a friend and colleague, Anisha Shekhar Mukherjee. Um, she provides um, a real insight, an in-depth insight about the historical and cultural context of from Indian philosophy, Indian science, and astronomy at the time which I seen built the observatories. And I think to really understand what he did, it's necessary to have that um, because his motivations and his uh, he's often faulted because he didn't you know, engage telescope-based telescope astronomy at this time. Um, but if you understand the, the context, you can really understand, in a sense, where he was coming from. Uh, and that research was beyond what I knew and understood and beyond what I could do. So it was very important to have that collaboration um, from Anisha. Then over the course of my work, with the observatories, which I really started seriously with the website around 2003, um, putting up the photographs initially and the virtual tour, which felt really important to do so that I could share my enthusiasm for the observatories with more people. Um, I realized I needed to, to kind of explain more and Little by little, I would add a section or add an explanation about this instrument or that instrument. Um, but then when it got to the book, uh, it was one of the things the editor said right away is, um, the photographs are incredible. It will make a wonderful photo book, but by itself, um, it's not enough. You've got to help people understand and learn about these places. So. The explanation section takes about 25% of the book, and it was a great learning experience for me. I developed uh, diagrams. I worked with an architecture student to generate 3D models and renderings. Uh, and uh, putting it all together within the design of the book was kind of a great project. And as you probably realize, I'm a do-it-yourself person. The immersion section is really the core concept and basis for the book. Uh, and I hope to have time to talk about that. Uh, panoramic photographs represented a real paradigm change for me. And I'll say only briefly that to look at the world 
in a spherical way um, rather than through a kind of a framed window uh, is a completely different way to see and think. In the VR version on the website, uh, our virtual reality kind of takes us back to the window, but makes the window movable and interactive so that somewhere behind the window is a sphere of, of pictorial information. And we can move that window all around as though we ourselves were there um, looking in different directions. When that spherical image is mapped into two dimensions, it becomes a very exotic looking um, kind of uh, representation or projection. And it can be visually quite beautiful. And for me, they were, they were compelling. Uh, I love them just for themselves as you know, strange abstract renderings. But in any case, um, the idea that even in a book, one could become immersed in the way in which the immersive um, media makes it possible, that was an interesting challenge for me. And it's one I took up and I'm hoping to prove and I'm hoping to um, share that with you. Uh, lastly, and again, how these things come along, the book was all done, but one of the reviewers said, you know, there's got to be a huge story behind this. How did all this happen? Why did you spend 30 years, you know? So the afterword tells the story about the project. Um, it's not a long story, but it, it's um, a number of pages and gives readers a chance to kind of see behind the scenes backstage in a sense. And then the book ends really at the beginning of my experience. My very first encounter walking into the observatory and um, being completely unprepared for what I was to see and really having my breath taken away. So with that, I'm going to page you through the book and I'll say a few things along the way, but I think we're just going to and you're going to look with me. So this is the beginning of Anisha's essay. It's about five or six pages. Uh, and then we move into the explanation section, um, which talks a little about the observatories, the four existing sites. And uh, one of the things I included in my explanation was uh, site plans, which um, many of the other books about the observatories and resources you know, have a site plan drawing. I thought it would be interesting to take the drawing and overlay it over the um, satellite view, uh, which I abstracted somewhat so that it wasn't as distracting. Uh, but here you see the Delhi compound, the instruments themselves are marked out and the sort of line drawings of the schematic ground plan are in red. And uh, another version is one for the Jaipur Observatory. And there include you no know, description of the observatory, a list of the major instruments there, and the location details. I also had to um, talk about astronomy, and it's not something I'm really that comfortable with. Uh, I have to kind of get back into my science mode. Um, but once I had a grasp of um, the different ways in which astronomers kind of look at and describe the sphere that surrounds the Earth, uh, I felt you know it was important to try to share this in a as um, simple a way as I could, uh, but accurate. So that's what uh, the page is about. On how astronomy thinks and works. And then it starts to translate into the instruments of the observatory. This is that mole instrument we saw. And in the detailed pictures, it shows how the two different um, coordinate systems were marked off. Uh, and I explain a bit about how the instruments could function at, uh, for both day and night observation. The Jai Prakash in the day is a sundial. Um, and at night, it's used in this way, 
uh, to sight through that um, sighting guide suspended above and mark the position of an object on the index down inside the instrument. Um, I talk about a lot of the instruments. I picked eight of the uh, sort of primary masonry instruments to go into detail about. And this is an example of uh, one of several pages of detail uh, using um, renderings from the 3D models that we built um, and diagrams I designed uh, to show how the movement of the sun or celestial objects were um, measured using the instruments. Uh, how this kind of a sundial compares with other kinds of sundials. And um, also some of the instruments that aren't obvious and aren't easily seen, this one, I'd love to tell you more about in watching my time, but it's actually inside the structure that holds up one of the quadrants um, at the big sundial. And it's, it's a camera obscura for the photographers, um, which has two aperture plates in its roof. It's quite dark in the day. But at noon, the image of the sun briefly passes through this uh, deep vertical chamber and shows up on those um, quadrant scales inside. The Jai Prakash, again, the um, paired instruments, these sisters, um, you can see in the detail on the right that the, uh, the white index scales um, they don't correspond to each other. Where there's a scale on the one at the top, there's a void in the one at the bottom. Where there's a scale on the one at the bottom, it's a void at the one at the top. And each one of those is 15 degrees, represents 15 degrees of arc, which is one hour of time as the Earth rotates. And so the astronomer would follow a celestial object on one of those scales, and when his um, his sighting guide reached the end of the scale and dropped off into the space he was in, he would quickly walk to the other instrument and pick up the measurement on the solid scale that represented the void that he had been standing on. Ingenious. And it exists in both this instrument and the Ramayantra uh, and both the Delhi and the Jaipur observatories. Again, here is that um, pathway that the astronomers would take between the instruments every now and the bowl instrument, the monomantra, I mean the cylindrical instrument. And so about immersion. So the beginning of the immersion section, um, I talk a little bit about how the uh, renderings that people are going to look at, how they're created. And I use the example of the Mercator projection of the globe to kind of understand what a, what a two-dimensional two projection like this, um, how it works. Uh, it has a few different terms that describe it, but the one I typically use is um, equi-rectangular. Uh, and what it does is, you know, it takes a segment of the spherical image, and it has to map that out segment by segment and make it flat. And to do that, it has to stretch the top and the bottom. So you see in the little diagram that of a, of a segment shape like this, the top gets stretched from corner to corner, and so does the bottom. And then piece by piece, all these segments fill in to make um, the whole image. And in this um, setup, the whole projection is in the background of the page, very lightly printed. And what you're seeing on the right is just a fragment of that view. It's a window into it, and it looks pretty much like a conventional photograph. And so when you turn the page, Again, you see grayed out behind the page is the full image, but I'm still showing the reader these two fairly conventional looking views. And I'm explaining that these views are both in the same photograph, but 
they're in different directions. But they look normal. If you just look at one and you look at the other, they look the way a camera typically um, reflects them. It's only when you see the final image and realize that those two views exist within this continuous large um, rendering that you realize there is the possibility of really looking at these big renderings and seeing both the literal, if you look in close enough, you really zoom in, um, in fact, even shade part of it and just look at a small part of it, you see what you're used to seeing. And it's only when you pull back uh, that you see what becomes a more abstract, curvilinear, strange in it. And um, my experience was that as I looked at these spherical photographs over time, I just began to develop mentally a way of understanding them. And it made me realize that along with uh, some research that I was doing, that we've learned to see the way we see. We've learned to see straight lines as straight lines because optically on the back of the retina, um, we're really seeing much more of a curved view, more the way a fisheye lens shows things. But in our mind, we make everything straight and we've learned to do that. We learned uh, Western perspective, single point perspective. Um, it was not as strong a convention um, before the Renaissance. So as we look at these things, they do seem exotic at first. And that to me, again, they're quite beautiful. I hope you agree. Um, but at the same time, they are kind of the whole world in one shot. And if you can, in a virtual sense, wrap yourself in this picture, you begin to approximate the kind of immersion that I'm hoping for you. And there is the old idea of, you know, I'm immersed in a book, I'm stuck in this book, it's compelling, it's a novel, a detective story. Um, I want you to become immersed visually in this one. So uh, these are some of the renderings from the Jaipur Observatory. We've already seen this scene in a more literal view in the video, um, but this is what happens when it gets mapped out. Um, but again, I work my way backwards from this view. I work my way into the picture and look at each little part of it uh, and begin to allow it to become my world and the edges start to disappear. So that's the immersive section. Uh, it's like a good 50 pages, um, lots of pictures. The other two observatories are well represented there as well. Um, and the afterward talks a little bit about how this all got started, which included a, a trip to India to photograph temple architecture. In fact, I wasn't planning to go to the observatories. I didn't know that much about them. Um, one of my friends at the time, um, suggested that if I went to India, I could not afford to miss the observatories. And I believe he's in the audience today. So I'm going to tip my hat to the young. But um, included in that trip, um, I had a, kind of a brief, well, in some measurement, maybe it was about a week that I was having to stay in New Delhi until all the permissions I had requested went through the bureaucracy. Um, and while I was there, I had visited the you know, John Monte, and that was the moment that changed um, kind of the tra trajectory of my work. I continued over the course of two months to photograph uh, temple architecture and um, kind of sacred architecture in Nepal, India and Nepal. And that became an exhibition project called Made of Light. But the observatories really made a strong impression and began to show that work separately. And um, it was all just black and white. 
um, and uh, not anything like the panoramic work I later did. But uh, I wanted to share with the readers a little bit about that first encounter and uh, tell the story of walking into the observatories and um, being awestruck and then uh, feeling but not really understanding um, a kind of sense of an authority behind those forms that were so powerfully represented in the architecture. My response was to work with the light and shading and the forms in a more abstract way in black and white. And that is what that audio work looks like. But it was um, really the impression that never left me and became a motiv motivating factor for the website and um, consistent engagement and study of the observatories and finally this book. And here we get to the back cover. And that's the end of our walkthrough, which I hope you have enjoyed. And I will pause here to read back the main screen. So Barry, thank you so much. That was that was really fantastic. And there are already some questions in the chat, and please keep them coming, everybody. The first question is. How did the astronomers publish the results of their research? Are there books, papers? Do these still exist? Yes, a great question. So the um, actually one of the motivations um, for Jai Singh uh, were the astronomical tables, what we would call an ephemeris. Um, I think in uh, the Islamic uh, language it's called a zij. Uh, and at the time that Jai Singh was doing all this, he was a regional king, uh, but he was under, or had given, uh, sort of pledged his allegiance to the, um, the uh, Mughal king um, or emperor, Muhammad Shah. And uh, Muhammad Shah and his astronomers were relying on tables uh, which really dated back to the Persian astronomer Ulugh Beg in the 1500s. And Jai Singh, uh, just even with ordinary instruments, had determined, and they were using astrolabes at the time, had determined that the tables were no longer accurate, uh, that the, the rising of a particular constellation wasn't, in fact, what the tables said anymore. And it was pretty critical because the real uh, religious and even governmental authority in India were the, the astrologers. So uh, in a way, astronomer and astrologer was really not a great difference in India at that point. Um, the, the people who did the calculations you know, had to understand the principles of astronomy. Um, but they did it in, in a very strongly connected way to the uh, religious uh, leaders and uh, the astrologers. So anyway, so the tables are called Zish, and um, Jai Singh's gift to Muhammad Shah after building the Delhi Observatory was a new set of, of tables that he dedicated to the emperor. Um, so I don't know how much they were updated. I think um, it took some time to you know, it was like maybe 10 years of measurements that were done to create more accurate tables. Oh, and Jai Singh, one of his claims was, you know, that he blamed the inaccuracy on the instruments themselves, the, the brass instruments. If they're used a lot, the pivots and everything that hold the parts together get worn. And, you know, so there's movement. So they don't, you can't really get precise instruments. Um, if they've been you know, in use a lot. And Jai Singh said, you know, let's make them out of stone so they never wear out. And, you know, an astrolab, it's not very big. Um, you can't get precision, you know, except for the microscope of humans. So he said, let's make them huge, you know, which is what he did. And 
Uh, they're as accurate as the engineering and construction that went into them. But I'm digressing, so I hope I answered that question. The next question is, could you explain what the cylindrical structures were used for? They don't seem to represent the celestial sphere. True. Um, so uh, they're kind of a combination of a horizontal and a vertical index. And so they had to be, um, they're inscribed, you know, based on trigonometry to be able to allow for the um, different projection angle compared to projecting under a perfect quadrant. Um, but I think they were much easier to construct. Um, constructing this hemispherical shape um, is very challenging um, because of the you know, construction of multiple planes. So, um, but given the transposition, you know, with the mathematics, um, the cylindrical instruments are, are fairly accurate, but um, their greatest accuracy is at the 45 degree angle mark. And as you get up towards the top of the scale or uh, closer in towards the cylinder um, at the center itself, um, they become less accurate. And the central column and the one in Delhi uh, has limited accuracy too because it's a little bit hard to get the exact center point. Uh, the one in Jaipur with the steel is more accurate. Was there any contact between Indian astronomers and their counterparts elsewhere at that time that these were constructed? Yeah, um, we understand that uh, the Jesuits who visited, um, actually visited Jaipur um, and uh, Jai Singh um, was quite familiar and received texts from Europe through um, the religious folks from Europe coming to India. Um, but I don't know that there was much collaboration or work in that sense. Um, Jai Singh was a, a scholar. He, he loved mathematics and music. Um, and in fact, you know, what's interesting is very young. He was 13 years old when he became king. And he was still quite young. Uh, that was in the late 1880s. Um, so he was still in his early adulthood um, when he was developing. Actually, he was born in the late 1880s. So no, he was really, um, I think, in his 20s when he was able to do Constructed. Could you say something about the relationship between the Janta and Mantars and what seems to be their urban environment and the, the questioner notes that there was some graffiti on some of the structures? Sure, yeah. Um, it's not an easy relationship. Um, and uh, maybe it's interesting to know that in India, um, monuments of this kind, um, if they're major cultural or architecture monuments, they come under the purview of the Archaeological Survey of India, which um, is responsible for maintaining and protecting India's historic um, heritage and, and monuments. Um, but the one in New Delhi is, you know, it's when it was built, it was built on the outskirts of the old city. Uh, on property that Chai Singh's family owned. Um, it were empty fields. Uh, we see engravings from the time that shows these exotic things are sort of rising up from just a barren field. Um, but with the urban development and small, um, they became surrounded by the city. So they, the observatory is right next to a major transport hub. And it's also become the site of um, kind of the place like I think it's Piccadilly Square. It's it's where all the protests are launched, um, political protests. So right outside the observatory, um, every day there's some kind of protest going on, and it is a virtually open to the public. It's a very low admission fee, so people go there on their lunch hours. It's a very pleasant place in the middle of the city. It's a green space, um, but it, there's not a Kind of a big budget for staff, and unfortunately, um, you know, can't be controlled all the time. So people carve things into the soft plaster. 
when I was in Jaipur, uh, was in 2004. Now it is a um, World Heritage Site. In 2012, it gained um, World Heritage status. And it's been, um, the government of Rajasthan, so for example, the archaeological survey does not uh, supervise or maintain the one in Jaipur. Um, the government of Rajasthan controls that observatory and is now maintaining it in much better condition. It has been cleaned up, painted, uh, protective guardrails. Um, it's much busier. In fact, just the difference between my 2001 visit and 2004 visit um, had seen enormous changes in the number of people. And now, I think the views you saw are relatively empty of people, but now, except for the fact that COVID, um, the observatories are filled with tour groups and people walking through them all the time. Uh, and the two smaller observatories um, in Varanasi and Ujjain, the one in Varanasi is on the roof of a palace. It's maintained by the Archaeological Survey, and it's kind of hard to find. Um, and I doubt that many people go there. So it's much smaller scale. You know, it's on the roof of a building. It has several instruments, like five or six, but they're smaller scale. Uh, and I'm waiting for the question, you know, why did John do four or five, maybe, but we'll get to that. Uh, and the one in Ujjain, Ujjain is uh, very important. It's an ancient city for India, uh, has a strong spiritual significance. Um, and also was, was at one point in India's prime meridian. Uh, and the observatory there functions today as a weather station and is also um, as an educational um, museum for school kids. So there is uh, an astronomer there, there's also a meteorologist there and people visit and um, they can tell time and uh, do other kinds of things by the, you know, by the sun, learn about how the ancients told time, um, but also uh, learn about you know, predictions of weather and actually there are weather instruments now sharing the site as well. Were observations continued after Jai Singh's death or only for a limited period of time? So, yes, it, it seems that it was uh, limited. Um, and I think I have read about 10 years um, that there were astronomers actively there. Um, something that I wanted to mention was something that Anisha shared with me. Um, also, that maybe sheds a little bit of light uh, on who Jai Singh was. Um, you know, the, the science is pretty exotic. And for an ordinary person, uh, these would be sort of awesome and incomprehensible things. But he built the observatories in a way that um, made them open to the public. Uh, and he invited people to come when the astronomers were there and just see what they were doing, maybe learn from them, nothing formal about it. But it was this kind of generosity towards his community, uh, among other things, that I think made him a kind of exceptional person. And also pretty astute politically, you know, because he built these things large, they become monuments. And, and even though they aren't used, or they weren't after the 10-year period, um, they kind of existed as an indisputable sign of his reign and his legacy and of all the you know myriads of regional kings and rulers from india uh, from those centuries he's pretty well known so i think it was smart <laughs> um i don't know maybe did I, did I get to that question oh it was about 10 years uh so there was a period of time when they weren't used in fact um, the Jaipur Observatory became a um, foundry for guns. It was a gun factory at one point. Um, when the British became um, kind of politically influential in India, um, 
somewhere in the early 1800s, mid 1800s, they, they began to uh, look more seriously at the preservation. There was a, a major publication from the Archaeological Survey um, from 1918 that I've used as a reference, and it goes back and talks about the different restorations. So at times, the observatories would fall into disuse and, um, and were abused, um, but the, um, the people in power, or responsible people, did take it on themselves to restore them. Uh, sometimes some accuracy was lost. That's one of the things that Anisha Mukherjee has been working with. She's a plant conservation architect, um, highly trained and very knowledgeable about the observatory. So she is uh, being consulted for restorations at the Delhi Observatory um, in terms of bringing back original markings, for example, and uh, making sure that they're accurate. And I should say this, the, um, the planetariums in, um, planetarium in New Delhi um, makes great use of the John Tarmanto there. They use it for all kinds of outreach. They do sky observation from there. They tell time. They do projects with school kids. Um, I got to know the director there, uh, Nandi Vada Rathmans. In fact, she was extremely helpful um, on both of my visits and has been helpful ever since. Um, she's been a strong supporter of the work I've been doing. Um, and I try to help her out and um, promote um, the activities that she does uh, on the social media for my website. Um, but on lots of occasions, they go to the observatories and um, even temporarily using chalk, you know, they put in markings where the markings have gotten lost. Just as a project, understand how they correspond to the actual celestial objects in the way they move. The next question is, did the Indian astronomers using these observatories have celestial models that correspond well to modern Western models of the universe? Or did they have some completely different conceptual model to account for their observations? Um, that's a really good question. I can only yeah. answer it partially. Um, the, they certainly knew the Western models, and in fact, the observatories used those models, uh, the two coordinate systems that are in use um, are based on what we use now. And in some of the research I did, I, I saw models that were comparable. Um, and here's where my you know, limits go back because I uh, don't know the, the full sort of the history of cosmic models before the one that we certainly have. I know, you know that there was the um, Earth-centric model, for example, and it was only at a certain point that we adopted the heliocentric model. But I think that, um, well, I think I'm going to stop there because I don't want to project So. I'm going to ask the next two questions together, um, which is, they are, can you please tell us a bit more about the spiritual significance of these observatories? And do we know how long they took to be constructed? Well, um, let me just say that um, the spiritual significance is too strongly connected with their function um, that they provided support for a way of understanding the significance and sort of power of the movement of the cosmos. Um, and to the extent that they mirror cosmic movement, um, they have a religious significance. In their form, I don't think they do. I mean, I we have you know, a wealth of examples of iconography uh, and sculpture and architecture in India that represents all of the, um, the belief systems of the, the Hindus and the Buddhists um, and the Sikhs and the Jains. 
uh, in India is a you know a multiple culture. It is there is no one India really. Um, it is a composite of so many different regional cultures um, and religious cultures. But um, the geometry of the astronomy in the observatories was to support the astrology and cosmology. Um, but the form itself, you know, no. In a way, I think to us, it really does speak to a kind of profound origin sense of mystery. If you give up any of the religious iconography or associations from any of the religions and just consider oneself sitting here with everything that we know when we look at the night sky, if open to it, you run into an unanswerable question. And you feel it. it's it's not a thought question, it's visceral. And when I was at the observatories, you know, one of the extraordinary moments for me was standing in front of the great sundial in Jaipur, watching the shadow movement and blowing, you know, that those little index markings which represented two seconds. And I was seeing the shadow sort of easing mark by mark by mark. And then I kind of became aware of myself just being standing still, and yet this motion is happening. And then I felt I'm standing still, and something huge that is in motion. And it is this thing that is within a great motion of the cosmos. And for me, in a way, that's the religious significance of the observatories that is there for anyone who will stand there on a sunny day and take a few moments to let their head clear and not be thinking about things and just witness where they are and what's happening. Now, there was a second half to that question. Uh, what was it? The second half, in addition to the spirituality, do we know how long it took to construct the observatories? Uh, uh, several years. Um, it varies. I think the Jaipur one takes the longest span of almost maybe 10 years, 1724 to 1727, 1734. I'd have to go to my book and look it up to tell you I don't have that in my head. Um, uh, the Delhi Observatory came together pretty quickly, I think because it was urgent to you know, make this gift to Muhammad Shah. And it's one of the first, really. Um, Jaipur was Jai Singh's laboratory. There, you know, he experimented there. There are models of the instruments, in fact, that like quarter scale, they're on the same compound. And in the museum, there are wooden and uh, masonry models, you know, on this scale of the instruments. Um, so he definitely you know, did a lot of modeling before committing you know, all that resource to building them. But then they took time you know, to build them. And they were built in pieces. You already started to address this a few questions back, but there's a question about the exchange of Indian astronomy and European astronomy at that time. Was there astronomy in the U.S. or was that non-existent? Boy, um, 1727, it would have been, um, for the most part, whatever was brought over from Britain, I would think. But, um, of course, you have um, indigenous astronomy. You have astronomy everywhere. So, um, but probably among the colonies, the uh, colonists, um, You, you would have essentially British and whatever the British folks were doing. I don't know if that's, I hope that's anything. Well, that makes sense. We have, we have I, I think the question of, you know, uh, who's astronomy uh, is interesting. And it's important to, you know, recognize how predominant our idea of astronomy is. 
and how many different ways there really are to understand um, the cosmos and to uh, speak to it in a sense, to listen to it and record it. Were the forms of these instruments invented for these observatories? Or are they scaled up versions of other instruments that were in use at that time? Uh, it's a mix. And um, I would say all of Jai Singh's instruments bear uh, some uh, debt you know, to earlier instruments. The Greeks had a bowl instrument with an obelisk in the center of it, um, a sundial. Uh, but it was relatively small. Um, the uh, Persians had a very well elaborated quadrant system, in fact, that found its way into Europe with uh, Tycho Bly. Um, so we have models of different ways of sighting, you know, and using surfaces to mark. Um, the instruments at Jai Singh's observatory don't do any of those um, fascinating projections like you have um, in the prehistory in the British Isles, um, the stone alignments and some of the cairns in which the rays of the sun kind of penetrate into a space and appear on a wall on a certain day on the solstice, for example. Um, so we don't have that model, but um, Jai Singh drew upon those models, so uh, he wasn't inventing a completely new um, system of architecture, but he really took those concepts uh, far beyond where they had ever been taken, both in scale um, and in precision and in complexity. And also, you know, I'll say, so, you know, there are like 16 instruments in Jaipur. Well, they don't do 16 different things. Um, they, many of them do similar things. They just do them differently. Uh, so some of them concentrate on when is exactly 12 noon. You know, and that, that's all they do. But they do that in a particular way. Um, as I said, the zodiac instruments, they're only in Jaipur. And each of those little sundial-looking things, each one is different, and they're each aligned to a different um, constellation. So they only function during the time that that particular sign of the zodiac crosses the meridian, the midpoint of the night sky. It's, it's really fascinating, actually. Um, the next question is, is also great. What, what to you makes this architecture? What makes this more than just measurement devices? Well, um, I don't know what an architect would say, actually, an architectural uh, historian. What makes it architecture for me um, is that, uh, and I have to say, it's kind of, I don't know where you draw the line between sculpture and architecture, but, um, but these buildings and spaces evoke meaning. Um, they represent information, they represent the gathering of information, the activity, um, they house the activity, but they also express it. So, you know, they're not different from a simple dome over a telescope, which you know from the outside as an observatory, because we know that's what observatories look like from movies and whatever. But these buildings actually express what's going on inside because of the way they're marked and inscribed, the inscriptions on the wall. Um, you know, they were decorated not with any other thing, they were decorated with you know, mathematical information. Um, so yeah, and what more to say? I want to invite everybody, if there are last questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to ask you, you have this really robust website with virtual reality and tours and so much information. How did you, what made you decide to turn it into a book? Right, really good question. Um, 
Well, you know, I hadn't thought about turning it into a book for a long time. Um, but once I got started on the idea, um, I realized, well, two things. One, um, the people who tend to think, you know, we have this amazing information on the web and we have this amazing media. Um, we don't need books. And, and at the time, you know, I'm in an architecture college, uh, art and architecture, and artists and architects love books. And as you know, in the fine arts library, um, we value incredibly the physical work, the, the physical book. And it was in a period of time, you know, five, ten years ago, when as the digital um, environment became more and more pervasive and more and more functional and more and more useful, um, the question was raised, so do we really need the physical anymore? Because this does it better, it takes up less space. Um, quicker to access. So I was in the midst of that kind of culture, and I realized, you know, we do love the book, and there is a difference. Um, and one of them is that technology is changing all the time, and, it, and its changes are fairly rapid. So the website goes out of date. The 2003 website doesn't exist anymore. The one built in 2015, which is the one that's up now, um, is getting old. It's time to, you know, rework it. Um, I never quite finished it because you'll find there's a few pages say, um, still working on this, but um, by and large, it was a huge project and it's very comprehensive. And a rebuild would still use a lot of that. But sooner or later, um, I'm not going to be interested in maintaining it or I won't be here to maintain it. And it's going to disappear, or it's going to be so so obscure that even if it were findable, nobody would necessarily look for it. But I love coming upon artifacts, like finding old gravures of photographs made, you know, in the 1920s of the observatories to see what they looked like back then. Um, I love the other books that I had to use for research, the archaeological survey book from 1918. Um, Virendra Sharma's marvelous, comprehensive study of the observatories, um, um, astronomical observatories of John Singh, which is in its third edition, I think. And so if it weren't for these books, uh, something would be lost. And I felt that this particular point of view that I was given um, and the photographic work um, really had a place in a book and it couldn't be replaced. I mean, the, the website is a different thing. The book could leverage the website. And that was exciting when I first had the idea of the book. I said, whoa, it's not going to be like an ordinary book, which just has to live by itself. It lives with this sort of tether to the website. Because if you really want to see a VR version, you can go to the website to see it. If you want to see a time lapse video, you can go there if you want to build a model of one of these instruments. You can get the plans from the website. So I saw it as synergistic. And um, I think when I argued that with the editors, because the editors asked me the same thing. I said, you know, one of their reviewers said, this is not a good, you know, this is a this is a bad project for the for Yale University to take on um, because people aren't going to be interested in the book if they have the website to look at. And I just had to push. Um, so that's the answer. I'm, I'm really glad that you did. I, I also wonder, do you have plans to go back to India or other projects related to the Janjan Mantas? Great question. Um, <laughs> so that, I've, I've asked that a lot. Um, I think, you know, if I were to go back, um, my sense now is that I would be working collaboratively much more. Um, these places have really started to become better known. Um, and the next really best way to see them would be to be able to fly around in them, to be able to levitate, you know. And I've, for the past 
year I've been working with drone photography, aerial photography, and I love it. I'm actually a private thing. I've always wanted to fly. Um, and this is one way we can kind of come close to that. Uh, so I think they deserve, you know, another documentation. But um, you can do virtual flights with architectural models. But to really do this uh, high quality, um, high def video, but to script it and develop kind of a, a sympathetic fly through that will resonate with the function that they're for and tell the story. But I don't think I would be able to do that. Number one, I don't think I could manage all the bureaucracy and permissions that it would take. So it would have to be a project that somebody else takes on and you know, I'd be happy to consult. So thinking of that, uh, one project that um, is coming up, and it's a way to mention for those that are still sticking with the talk, um, in around 2010, I had a chance, well, actually, I had a chance to show the panoramic photographs inside a planetarium in 2005 at the Denver um, Planetarium, the Gates Planetarium there. And that was a phenomenal experience because it was the first time I was actually able to replicate the experience of being there. Um, and later, I got to know an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, um, who was actually uh, part Indian. He was born in Delhi. And um, I think I got that right. But in any case, uh, Mark Subarau, and he um, invited me to come and show the panoramas there. He was thinking about either doing a show about the John Termontors for a planetarium audience. Um, but initially, he incorporated uh, a number of the panoramas in a show they produced called Cosmic Wonder, uh, which was a major planetarium show that ran for several years. And um, it was like my first realization of the much larger purpose of this panoramic work. So um, fast forward to now, there's a project to do a major planetarium show about astronomy historically in different cultures around the world. And one of the cultures is India. Um, and uh, it's being sponsored by the 30 Meter Telescope Society, which is a nonprofit organization you know, for education and astronomy. Um, and, but one of the producers is really a subcontractor just working on the India part of this big video is going to be doing a piece about India and it focuses totally on the Jantar Mantars and telling the story of Jai Singh and these observatories. And they've asked me to collaborate on uh, providing the panoramic photographs and the uh, 3D models that they are developing into animations. And so I don't know how long it'll be, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15, but it'll exist as either part of a planetarium show or a short that can be shown by itself. And that's slated to happen somewhere in 2022. But I'm really excited again. Um, the project has had help from so many people all along the way, either direct on the ground help or help because people were interested and asked great questions. Um, and Collaborators is just wonderful to be able to kind of turn this over and see it reach um, new uh, new forms and new iterations in, in the hands of different people. There's a there's a comment that the planetarium presentation was magnificent, which I think is worth sharing. Was what? It was magnificent by some by by a, a person who saw it, which. Ah, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we have to wait until planetariums open again, and then it's true. Um, <laughs> Ed, Ed said this. Ed, Ed Reed, which is great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. He was living in Denver at the time. <laughs> if there aren't further questions, I'm going to share the slide again that I showed initially um, with the. 
title of the book and the promotion code from Yale University if people want to buy it or to order a personalized copy should visit www.gentarmantar.org. And I wanna thank you, Barry, for this fantastic talk and thank you all for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Marcia, can I say one more thing? Absolutely. Just about the, um, the personalized copies. That if somebody wants a signed copy, um, they do that because we can't go out to book launch events in this time period. I do that through the website, jantarmantra.org. There's a, a small online shop that I set up. Um, it's uh, The books are basically sold at this price. Um, and if you've already bought a book or you order a book from one of the other sellers, you can order a book plate uh, for a nominal cost. I think it's like $5 plus postage. A signed book plate. So I'll be happy to sign it for you, um, personalize it, and send that off to you in the mail if you already have a copy. Uh, you know, it's not a profit thing. It's just um, trying to reach out and connect with my audience. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you all.